firstly, let's talk about one client acquisition strategy that I really like um, that has helped me scale my business to six figures and uh, has made it a lot more fun. Um, because for me particular, in particular, I'm not a huge, I mean, everyone really, when you're starting out, it's always great to set up a cold outreach system to try to get calls in that way. But what I like want to talk about is networking and connection calls and white label partnerships. Um, because when I started to switch my focus toward, um, creating a network and a connection calls and, you know, just seeking other types of marketing agencies that don't exactly offer bots. Maybe they offer Facebook ads or they build websites or they do SEO. Any agency with a bunch of clients where I can jump on a call, network with them, offer some free value and some strategies and uh, um, have them upsell my service for their clients is a huge win for me. I think one of the problems we all run into when we're trying to scale a business like this up that, you know, and let's be honest, fulfillment it can be complicated, right? Um, it's not always straightforward. Oftentimes the work is quite custom. You know, I'm working hard every day to productize a service as much as possible to streamline that. Um, but at the end of the day, a lot of the things we're doing out there is custom. So it can get very, uh, it can become a huge time drain when you're managing like 40 clients. So one thing that I did along the way to switch is I talked to these agencies. So I would talk to, let's say, a Facebook ad strategist and, um, you know, someone with maybe a, you know, a bunch of clients and he does Facebook ads and he, let's say, you know, for example, generates leads for clinics. Um, uh, you know, what often happens for a Facebook ad agency is they're trying to drive traffic to a landing page, their leads for a business. So I would have a conversation and maybe build a demo and show them like, hey, you know, when you actually do the same thing, except drive it to a messenger funnel or, or a, a chatbot, um, you can get all of these ancillary benefits. For example, um, on a landing page, if someone lands there and is looking around and maybe isn't 100% sold or sure, uh, they could just leave, right? Um, and that means that traffic has been driven there, but they haven't actually closed or captured that lead. So that's going to be a big percentage of the traffic that goes to these pages. Um, so what I offer is to replace that actual landing page with a chatbot. Um, because what happens is, is when they start to drive that same traffic and the ads can be very similar, right? So you ex should expect the same number of clicks and the same ef ef uh, effectiveness of the ad. But when they go into Messenger, as many of us probably will know, um, you can, they're automatically subscribers. You can educate them on the service and qualify the lead in a really fun and engaging way. Um, and one of the big aspects that you wouldn't be able to do using a landing page is, is uh, automatically follow up. So, you know, there's going to be a percentage of people that get in the bot and they go through and they give their phone number and email, and then I'll build an integration to send all that off to the client or the clinic in this case. Um, and that's great. But then of course, there's going to be probably a 40 or 50% of people that don't go through it start to finish. So what I'll do is we'll set up tags for those people who don't actually finish the qualifying form. And all of those people will then get their automated, automated follow-up in the sequence. So um, it really is a way to maximize the leads that are generated for a Facebook ad agency. Um, so how I find those people is I'll, I'll Google, like, let's say a market I know that I have an effective chatbot for or that I want to just start with or focus on. So one interesting thing about this is that I really find that I enjoy the conversations even more with the agencies because they're also marketers. So I'm not kind of educating someone from scratch. So what I would do is I would, I would research and even on Facebook or on, in Google, even, uh, marketing companies that serve a particular market, like, you know, Facebook ads for solar, Facebook ads for chiropractors. And you can, you can end up finding, you know, the names of the people who are uh, helping these agencies. And then I'd either reach out to them on Facebook or just by email. And um, 
you know, you can at that point, I know a lot of you from Bot Academy, you can send them your demo video with your narration of the bot flow. But oftentimes I'll just kind of reach out for a connection call and just say, hey, I love what you're doing in this space. You know, I've been doing some cool things in the space too. It'd be awesome to connect and just uh, share. I'm always looking to add value in the in the space. So it can be a really low obligation type of conversation. And I, I honestly more treat it like networking. Um, it is just can be the most fun. What do you charge? Okay, so when it comes to these white label partnerships, I have found that the easiest way is to avoid, unless you're getting a percentage of some sort of sales, um, to avoid percentages, to just tell them based on what that bot project looks like, what the cost is for the investment, and then they can go charge it for whatever they want, like go and, and upsell it for whatever they want and get whatever piece they feel is reasonable for their client. Um, uh, that is what I found to be the most straightforward. Um, Nick, have you had some experience with that? Uh, does that sound in alignment with what you do? Yeah, so I've done it both ways, and I agree. It's it's yeah. just easier when, but the, I mean, there's some pros and cons to doing both. Mm -hmm. uh, and it depends. So for you, Stephen, like, do you tend to try to negotiate a set price up front or are you quoting per bot? Um, well, in these cases, I found that usually it's, uh, it's the, they're running this, the, they're, they've picked a market and they're doing this, uh, usually this, a pretty similar thing for each client. Um, so for me, it's usually a pretty standard pr price, right? So I really like these deals. Like I know that, you know, a lot of people in the bot group um, talk about like only trying to take on projects that are, you know, they're charging like 5k or 10k or this and that. I don't, I do that those, but I also, I like these like $500 per month projects that are lead qualifying costs that are super automated where like I can pretty much maintain it on my own very easily. Um, so I've found that a lot of the deals with these types of agencies, you know, it might be like a $500 per month for me, they could charge eight fifty, a thousand, twelve hundred, um, and, uh, it just kind of runs. Yeah, no, no, I'm, I'm totally with you. I mean, so, and that's what I've always thought. It's like, if you're going to do something custom, you need to charge for it. But if it's something that you can really automate the shit out of yeah. in a lot of ways, like you don't need to. And it's just so easy to like pump those, like almost templatize it. And that's what needs to happen. If you're going to charge a minimal setup fee and do 500 bucks a month, very little work in, in maintaining that and providing value. So that's, I mean, obviously that's the big one, right? The first mm -hmm. thought, you got to make sure that it provides value across the board and that it can be duplicated. So it's hard to templatize in my experience at first until you have experience with that market but mm -hmm. once you do yeah and like and like there's no reason to not try right like it all starts as an experiment and one of the cool things about this space is that it's it's all new so it's like yeah you can go google and try to find other bots to look at or mimic or whatever but at the end of the day um if you understand the business's pains and you can have an effective discovery call um and you can you know i always ask the same questions you know what kind of ad, are you running facebook ads are you uh, how do you how do you attract clients now or patients in this case? I think we're talking about chiropractors um, uh, because when you when you learn their existing system, it becomes a lot easier to just tap into it, right? Um, yeah. And I mean, it all kind of you start to see patterns not only in one market but in just types of businesses. Uh, like pretty much all these people want is lead qualifying and conversion on their advertising and being able to nurture and follow up. So. Um, the bot is usually very similar and, um, you know, I have it in auto dealers, I have it really down to, you know, in some of my partners, like it's pretty much the same bot. Like I've, I can, you know, they sell it for 3000, I get half and, uh, you know, it don't tell anyone, but it probably takes me around like a half hour to implement, um, yeah. So it's a good deal. Yeah. But, but the thing is though, like, it only takes you half an hour now to implement, yeah. but like all the work and the effort and figuring out what converts and what doesn't was done up front, like with a couple different clients. So it's all the, it's like the culmination of all that work that makes it easier mm. to roll out across the board. Thanks man. I'll take it. No, but you can't discount that. Right. Oh, like, that's true. Cause anybody could try to roll out a bot across those clients. Well, then it's just going to fail across 20 clients instead of one. Right. Until you, 
So I, I think, yeah, I mean, I think I'm a big proponent of learn the market, like try to get some success, early success. I think you can go broad and wide until you find something that's working. Mm -hmm. And then you start to drill down and like what you've done. Mm -hmm. Then I think it's also easier to understand the market's pain points. So I think one thing I noticed with people going into clients is that they don't know the market and they try to speak to pain points that may or may, may not exist for that client. So like you were saying, like you just try to find out like what sucks. It's versus, okay to ask questions. Yeah. Like, like even if I know what they're going to say, I, I don't um, like, even if I know what they're going to say, I ask it as if it's new, if it is, it's fresh. Right. Like I might allude to like, yeah, we've been doing this a lot with this industry and, you know, we have our ideas, but I, I'll be up front. I'll say, you know, but I'd love to just hear from your perspective fresh because I, I see myself as a problem solver and there's a, a wide range of things that they can do. And this is, these are in occasions where I'm actually having the sales call, but in a lot of the cases, it's just with the JV partner in this context um, where they are already clear on the method they're using, right? So they can just tell you what they're doing. And you're just like, oh, well, let's just do what you're doing in a chatbot, you know? Yeah, no, 100%. I mean, I think, and those deals are always nice. Like when they have a proven system more or less and we're just taking it into a bot. Uh, yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. yeah, and there's one other question here um, just in regards to this, and then maybe we can talk a little bit about cold outreach. Oh, not uh, to interrupt, like where are you seeing these questions? I'm um, struggling a bit. Oh, it's okay. I'm just, I got it. I'm just- uh, You got them? Cool. Yeah, just because it's the last question in the old thread. Okay, um, perfect. So we're still on the topic, so I thought it would just- complete that i'm just on the facebook page um so zering is asking about didn't understand the tagging and qualification process so john's answer is absolutely correct here so what you can do is you essentially you'll apply this is what you'll do you'll subscribe everyone who enters the chat flow to a follow-up sequence and then when they get through the qualification flow and they actually submit their phone email or whatever is being asked you unsubscribe them from that follow-up sequence, which means everybody who is subscribed and doesn't finish the form is then going to get those follow-ups. Um, so that's how you do that. If you want to uh, let us know in the chat if that made sense, um, that's great. Cool. So I, from the new chat, uh, John asked, how do you communicate the value? Oops, sorry. So how do you communicate the value that $500 a month uh, for the prospect. So I have prospects that run away as fast as they can as soon as I drop a price like that. Oh, okay. Um, well, is this, a, is it, I mean, my question for you, John, is are you talking to a JV partner in this example or are you talking to a regular client? Um, because when I'm on, well, we can just discuss both, um, Nick. Uh, I mean, for me, when I'm, when I'm talking to a JV partner, um, it's really easy to communicate the value because they know all the numbers, right? Like they, they're running the ads and they know what the landing page is converting and they know the problems, right? So if I have someone tell me, you know, we got 140 leads and they only closed three, um, that to me is like, or they don't, or they only actually, uh, got three leads from like 140 opportunities or if that makes sense. Um, uh, that screams chatbot for me, conversion tool, right? So that screams follow-up, nurturing, keeping in touch, um, making it more fun, enjoyable, building affinity for the clinic or the brand of this company. Um, so if they know the numbers and they're saying, okay, well, this percentage of people are being closed on a landing page, and I can say, well, what would happen if we followed up with every single one of those people who didn't leave their information? Like right away, they, they understand the value in that. Um, what do you think, Nick? Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> I think that's the most direct comparison that we can take a lot of times. If they already know the exact numbers in their funnel is set, then it's pretty easy to say, okay, well, now let's look at this from, now you're gonna get about an 80% open rate, higher click-through rate. Let's assume the conversions stay the same, which oftentimes they actually go up, at least I've found. Um, but even taking like the kind of the minimal numbers, here's what we can expect in terms of value for, you know, your client. 
So I think it's easy to say, all right, I can sell that for, you know, they already are selling something for 3K. They can sell this for four, three. They'll, they'll have a good idea of what they can sell it for. Yeah, and, and in the, you can even dive deeper. It's like, it's like, what is the lifetime value of an acquired client, right? Like, what, how much money is this worth to you? So in this current system, you're generating 10 patients a month, which that's just simple math, which equals, you know, $5,000 or $1,000 of revenue, right? And uh, so what would it be like if you, you know, if you, so they're closing 10 of 100, what would it be like if you closed 15 of 100, you know, or 20 of 100 or 25 of 100, all of a sudden you are very clear on what their, the, the ROI is on your services and 500 ends up being kind of peanuts, um, if by comparison. Yeah, that, that's one of the things that we definitely try to do all the time. It's concept like that, that I'm, probably a lot of you guys have heard of also is price anchoring. Mm -hmm. So like Stephen was saying, right, if you can express the value of our, your client is worth 5,000, we're going to bring you, or even 1,000, we're going to bring you an additional five clients a month. That's $5,000 extra a month. Well, you're only paying me five hundred dollars a month to bring you five thousand <laughs> right so and it, it can come off a little salesy if you do it the wrong way uh and some people don't like it but if you if you just run through the numbers and have them tell you their numbers so you're not telling them they're telling you mm -hmm. it's very easy to see all right that there's a great roi on this service and that's the thing like if you can prove value 500 bucks, a thousand bucks more, as long as the value is there and you can deliver on it. I mean, I don't, do you feel the same way? Is that, is that kind of? Oh yeah. I mean, that, it's, it ends up being, I think that in our own minds, we, we always like to make things more complicated than they are. Like it's this, it's really that simple. Like, especially if you're talking to the marketing agency, like they're, and you just start talking about the chatbots and showing them the things that, that they can do. And when you talk about the market data behind a particular um, uh, industry as well, um, it just becomes really straightforward and people are willing to give it a try a hundred percent. So um, even if you're brand new, like you can find people who are like, oh, well, who become really curious by it, you know? And it's like, oh, they can make more money. They can get better results for their clients. They can get more prospects in a funnel that nurtures over time and it can be done for only $500. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the thing though, like with, <laughs> with these marketing agencies, they already understand a lot of this shit. They may not know bots. So I, I think that's the biggest thing, at least for some of the partners that I have is actually educating them about bots and what the potential is yeah. so they can then sell it to their client um, versus the, the price point. That hasn't been almost as much of an issue, although it's a struggle al always to be like, hey, I don't want to own underprice. I don't want to price myself out. But, you, at, is, but when you work with a market, then you get a better and better feel. But initially, that shit's always hard if you're in a new place, new market. You just don't know. You got to try things. And frankly, um, I kind of play with my pricing a little bit too. Yeah. Just, yeah, because you just don't know until until somebody tells you no and somebody tells you yes, like you just don't quite know what the value really can be mm -hmm. despite the numbers. So I yeah, don't it. be afraid. I mean, it's going to suck sometimes. They're going to tell you no, and, and you're going to figure it out later. Yeah. So um, uh, our, our friend from the Bot Academy, Yvonne, was asking, what do you actually do for the maintenance? Um, Marcel, I don't know if there's a way to see the comments. They're On my screen, they're kind of ending up below, and I, I lose them. But um, uh, oh, wait, videos. Yeah, I think they're scrolling off maybe, but... Yeah, but in the last one, I could see them all. Um, so anyway, Yvonne, I, I did remember she asked, like, what are you actually doing? So in terms of, like, a scope of service, um, I would offer our lead qualifying flow, uh, two automated follow-ups, um, and this is just a direct example with one of my partners, um, uh, Facebook ad integration, so I'll send them the JSON code, for instance. Um, and uh, Zapier integration, so we can either email or put all the lead info into a Google Doc or something like that. Um, da, 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 da. And if you're if you're uh, if you've been doing bots for a little while, you can start to see like, oh wow, all that stuff seems pretty automated. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, it's pretty automated. So uh, it's not it doesn't have to be a lot of work on an, uh, um, 
maintenance basis, but I'd monitor the system. You know, I offer the priority support from being a many chat agency partner. Um, you know, we, we give them the little bonuses like that, that kind of differentiate myself from, you know, the rest. Um, but that's usually what's included unless, oh, in a widget on their website, we've got to maximize that organic, uh, traffic as well. So I'll, I'll send them widget code. So it's, it's all kind of set up and then it runs for as long as they're doing the campaign. Does that sound similar to you, Nick? Yeah. I mean, it, ours really depend and vary in scope. Um, because we're doing like intentionally going after e-commerce, usually ours, um, so not, not, a, not to try to plug my own, my own stuff too much, maybe a little, but we're doing some cool stuff with abandoned cart sequences. We created a SaaS product that uh, sits between Shopify and ManyChat. Um, so that's pretty standard for us and is kind of a good foot in the door. So it's abandoned cart um, receipts, but you can also segment by like your customers later on by total order value and some cool things shipping notification and then um post purchase follow up like generating reviews it's actually fairly automated too which is cool but it took a lot to develop that by the way shop message does some of this stuff too so you, there are other tools out there that you can have off the shelf you can contact me i'm happy to tell you about mine but same situation like, I'm starting. Yeah. A, I'm launching an e-commerce company in a couple of weeks, actually, and I can't wait to use Nick's software. I'm so pumped. It's going to be awesome. I'm really excited. Um, you know, so Esther's asking. I think we probably covered this, Esther. Um, in terms of her question was, can you give an example of a bot template that doesn't need much customizing, how it still converts? So um, that's kind of what we we're just discussing in terms of like a lead qualifying flow. And it would just be connected to Facebook ads and that same using that same promotion or offer on the website and the organic Facebook page and these types of things. Um, because then it's just out. And, you know, usually you try to pick an offer that they like to always run. You know, if they if this is something that is like the staple of their business, um, uh, then they then they're gonna understand they they're gonna wanna always be running it and always be having it very available. Yeah, I mean, it is, yeah, you can do it for almost any market. Like if you're, if you're talking about coaches, and I know lots of people are interested in doing it for them, most coaches are running lead, ma like something to a lead magnet, then to a webinar, or I mean, the flows can vary. But usually the entry point is, hey, here's your freebie. Right. Real easy to do inside of a bot and kind of roll that out across multiple coaches. And then, um, you know, they, they constantly uh, change those, but I just showed you a bot yesterday that was for a coach. Um, oh using, yeah, that's right. Uh, yeah, like using the Facebook ad training as a lead magnet in that sense. So he he is a Facebook ad guru or you know influencer in that sense, and you know the training, the lead magnet is actually the Facebook ad training. Um, so Zeering here, Nick is asking, um, have you ever tried to run ads for your chatbot agency? Uh, if so, would you call out, uh, what would you call out in the ads since I would think that small business owners don't understand chatbots initially. And what do you think would be a good offer from a cold Facebook ad trying to get small business clients? Interesting. Uh, so, so yeah, I may not be the right person cause I minorly hate small business clients. <laughs> it's just that, like, it's not my oh, market. Are you frozen? Oh. Oh. Did I freeze? You froze for me for like 10 seconds. Okay. So I was just saying, maybe, maybe you want to take that. Uh, Cause I, I working with small business clients is not my thing. And I'll tell you, it's primarily because they don't have the money in the, um, to do these, even at 500 bucks a month, it tends to be, to be hard. They're also not often doing a whole lot of marketing. Um, at least internet marketing. So well, what, if, what if we talked about it like this, Nick, because um, I feel like a lot of people feel like the word small business is quite a lot more broad than maybe we're taking it. Um, like what if it's just like a, like a chiropractic office, like that's not really a small business that can be like a multi-million dollar business. Um, uh, would you work with someone like that? Yeah. Okay. So, so I guess the qualify, you know, like if you qualify the person and they have the money to spend, they're doing some advertising, they are the right fit for a bot then then sure i would work with them 
no problems. So sorry, um, just to clarify, his question was, um, if you were targeting businesses with Facebook ads, so have you, have you done your own ads for your stuff? Yes. Yeah. Um, so I think targeting businesses way too fucking broad. Like it's just, you can't do that and have an ad that's directed to somebody. Hey, small business owner, is this for you? Like it just, it doesn't speak to any pains or benefits of that particular business. Mm -hmm. So this is one of those where I think it's best to, to pick a market and Facebook lets you target pretty darn tightly these people. So if, if we pick chiropractic, so Eric asked who I go after e-commerce businesses, but more specific targeting than that even. Uh, but, but if we picked chiropractic, so Stephen Lane, what's, what's one of the top pains chiropractors have? More patients. More patients. So in terms of, yeah, they, we could even probably get more specific than that. Is it they can't? More, they don't, more back pain patients or more, um, more patients for stem cell rehabilitation. Cool. So if you were the chiropractor there, you're talking to a guy, is it generally that they don't even have the interest in it or they're getting people on the phone or wh where's the drop off? Where's the disconnect between? Just, a, I think, awareness and knowing there it exists um, and being able to just like connect with a cold audience, right? Like, I feel like in most cases, you know, the opportunity to educate a cold audience on the benefits is, I think, pretty big in chiropractic because uh, I think a lot of people just go their whole life without even realizing it. I know I was, and I have these pains, and what people do is they'll um, they'll treat the symptoms but not the, the core uh, you know what I'm saying? Yep. Uh, the actual, like the, the, the systemic. Yeah. yeah I, I get what you're saying. Yeah. You know. yeah. Um, so, so yes, you're, you're going to have to d dive into the exact pain. So even if we were to say like getting people in the door, I'd want to know more specifically from the people, the chiropractors I've talked to also, is it because you've tried marketing before and it just hasn't worked? Like what's the issue, right? So if we do dove down and said, yeah, we tried Facebook marketing, we tried it on our own, we didn't get it to work, I would create an ad that speaks very much to that pain and proposes Messenger as a solution. I would let them learn more in a lead magnet or a video or a step-by-step -step kind of pre-sell page. So maybe like, hey, here's the step-by-step -step offer that I did to take this chiropractor to, you know, 100 patients booked in two months and then at the end they can get in touch with you um also know that uh so i would but by the way that like i would run it to messenger i wouldn't just go to directly to the pre-sell page mm -hmm. i would do something taking them into messenger because that's the experience their their customers are going to have right so i'd want to demo that and make them go through it and the, how powerful that could be then either teach about it inside Messenger or a pre-sale page or something like that. Mm -hmm. And you also have to understand that just doing the upfront kind of interest ad, so there are kind of three pillars that you can look at. You're going to have awareness. You're going to have other people that um, kind of are middle of the funnel that, that have looked at your stuff but haven't purchased from you yet. Uh, and then you have loyalty, right? So the people that are your customers, can you sell more to them? So the stuff, the, the awareness piece oftentimes isn't all that profitable. It's when you start, this guy, okay, watched 70% of the video that I sent him in the awareness piece after he went to Messenger or went to my pre-sale page but didn't contact me. It's when you start retargeting those people and showing up in front of them again and again, that's where a lot of the ROI comes from. So it's not a simple Facebook ad. It's more of a funnel approach, whether it's in Messenger or anything else. It's just very hard anymore to, to sell immediately. Mm -hmm. And that's never really my goal. It's more to create the relationship. And that yeah. does end up paying off. It's just a little bit longer and more complex process.
I love that. Like, I feel like to recap, so you pick a specific market, you pick a specific pain point, one of their biggest pain points that they're experiencing in their marketing. Um, you educate them on how messenger parking can nurture that relationship. Uh, and it leads to a strategy session, probably not immediately because people get their, you know, their, yeah, their, exactly. Their and, that. and the cool part with ads is you can split test some stuff. So maybe it's not always just like, Hey, this pain sucks for you. You can also split test a different ad. You can split test a different pain, or you can go the opposite side and do like five tips to get more customers in the door, do a more positive spin. So either it's, it's kind of emphasizing and it's kind of twisting the knife in a pain. So, or kind of move toward pleasure or the end benefit that they want to see. So those two very things, nothing in the middle is great typically. Um, and then you could, they can go to very much similar content. So it's just the initial ad testing that, that, and it's not that hard to do, which is nice. And you quickly find out if it's working or not. Right. That's awesome, man. Yeah, I haven't personally run many Facebook ads, so um, I'm putting my learning cap on as well. Yeah. Uh, so Esther's asking, and I know that we have a few other questions, though. I mean, we'll really focus on client acquisition, but that was the big one. So we'll have those four other questions as well. But Esther's asking, why would you charge so little if the agencies make so much more? Couldn't you find these clients yourself and charge 5K? Uh, yeah, you can. You can go and find all the clients and charge them all the money up front, and you could probably even find your own ads person and either get a referral fee or they could white label you. Um, that's something that has that definitely happens as well. Um, it depends on you and what feels aligned for you. So I know in my life, I would rather have frequent calls with 10 people than occasional calls with 50 people. So when I have, if I were to have, let's say I have 10 white label partners or joint venture partners, I'm, I'm talking to them about 50 people instead of having to talk to all 50 people. Um, so that's how I see it. And the benefit to me is I get to manage less clients, um, but make, still make all the money. Um, no, I mean, I look, I think there's a big benefit to that. Talking to fewer people is and having to, to project manage all of everybody is a pain. Yeah, the project management ends up being one of those things. But I mean, you can also solve for that, right? Like we, you or I could hire a project manager. Absolutely. Then I mean, this is where like, you know, we're, I mean, I know for Nick and I, like, I think I would, we would call ourselves more solopreneurs in this space at the moment, right? Like I have a team of bot builders who are contractors who do a lot of implementation for me. Um, but to grow more and to manage more and all that, like you're really talking on full blown agency and this kind of yeah. thing. And for me personally, that's not my goal. I know it was really cool meeting Jason Swank at the conversations conference. You know, he was, he's quite known for, and he's in our bot group as well. I think um, uh, he's quite known for scaling his agency to millions of dollars and selling it and having his exit. Um, so that's definitely an option. And if you want to go that route, you know, it's all about, you know, at every single level of what is happening in the business, like creating a system around it and then having, and then handing the keys off to a manager on those levels. Um, yeah. Yeah. I think it comes down to like what, what you want out of it in a lot of ways. Um, I know for me, like I, I actually do work with more, more directly and go after clients directly more than, than you do. I think Steven, mm -hmm. um, for me, it's just one of those things that like, I don't want to be too reliant on any one channel. Uh, mm. So that, that's part of it. Because if, if one of the JV partners goes away or something happens, that can be a big hit. So we like, and, and I found, found out actually the hard way that we'd stopped doing as much lead gen. And uh, yeah, it hurt our business for a little bit until we really, because we were struggling actually to maintain clients. Then a couple dropped off and things happened and, mm -hmm. It's just, you got to constantly keep up and try to, to, you know, have a little more than, than you need. So for us, that's, you know, lead gen, also getting new partners in, all of that stuff. So in case somebody does, or one piece of it doesn't end up working that month or for a while, we're still okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting, right? Like for me, in, this, in a similar way of wanting to diversify I've, I'm launching two other businesses in different spaces. 
you know so for me it was like i don't want to do cold outreach like i don't want to like have an email scraper and these types of things and like that 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 just never really felt like me um so I, in my spare time i'm like trying to set up other businesses uh, in a similar way but like i definitely think you make a really good point like never wanting to be super and not never at first focus on like the one thing that's yes. going to get you to the next step one thing at a time keep it super simple i think talking to people who are a little bit ahead like you you it feels you can get this overwhelmed feeling but it really isn't like just focus on that one thing because you're gonna organically figure all this stuff out as well along the way and you'll be able to get to a place especially when you're really comfortable in your income where you can just choose and what feels good for you what do you really want um and then make a decision like that uh Tim has a good question here, um, Nick. Uh, are y'all building bots on a, an account they run, or are you adding them to your account? What do you usually do? Does that make sense to you? Mm, not quite, because so so, so uh, I think what he means is like is like, are we creating an account for them that they run and can have control and ownership of, or do we own the bot and the service? And if let's say they were to fire us, the bot would go away fully. Got it. That's how I read it. Yeah, I, I, I would. Yeah, I think you're probably right, Tim. And if we're, if we're wrong about that, let us know, but I guess let's, let's answer that one. I, um, it depends for me. Uh, so for the, the abandoned cart stuff that I was just talking about, it's it's a SaaS product type thing. I own that. They're essentially paying monthly, like a like a lease agreement almost. If they stop paying me, that thing goes away. Um, but on the flip side of that, most bots, like custom bots that I build, are entirely the clients. Other than at least that piece, or you know, certain very limited in scope pieces. Because I feel like the client has paid a setup fee and then they're paying me monthly to maintain it. That setup fee to me entitles them to, to that work and that piece of it. I don't know. How do you feel about it? If I, if I have integrations built on my systems, then like I always treat the bot as, uh, especially when they pay the setup, like you said, like it's theirs. Um, but for a lot of clients, they don't necessarily have like all of the accounts that you need for integrations or to complete the system. So if they cancel the service, yeah, like I'm just gonna, if they're an admin of the bot, I'm just gonna leave it. I'm not gonna like delete it, you know? Like I don't see a point in doing that. Um, but uh, it doesn't mean that I'm gonna like, you know, go set up integrations on their own Zapier account because they're canceling, you know what I mean? So it just means that a lot of the bot will just start stop working in those cases. Um, uh, but yeah, like, you know, a couple people who, you know, didn't end up doing as well in their business or whatnot, um, or couldn't decide they couldn't afford certain things. Like, you know, people do drop off from time to time. And, uh, you know, even a recent one who had something like an 86% click rate in their bot, like kind of blew my mind. Um, <laughs> but, uh, uh, I, I just leave the bot and they just go on with it and, you know, do their best with it on their own. It happens. Yeah. I mean, for even for some of that stuff, it depends on how tech savvy they are. A lot of times I'll still have them set up their own Zapier account. Right. Um, it, it depends. It just, it, it depends. Like I've done both ways. I usually try to have the client own as much as that piece as possible. So like you set up your Zapier account, I'll go in there and I'll manage it. I'll set everything up. So in case I do leave, you know, you still paid me for a functioning bot. It's still there. It's yours. But for some others that aren't and don't want to do that piece, yeah, I mean, it's on mine and it's but part of my monthly you, like, you end up having to like have everyone know your clients' passwords and whatnot. Like I, I do prefer to have it in my Zapier account because then I can like go tweak and edit without like going to some like dossier of passwords to like jump uh, in. LastPass, real easy. You just, so you put all of their clients' info into LastPass and then it just saves it for you and it's whatever. I have them send it to me via LastPass. So they, they need to set up a LastPass account and they just share that information with me because mm -hmm. I don't want to be responsible in any way for their, their passwords or breach of anything. Like, mm -hmm. So it's a secure way they can share it with you. Uh, right. And then it just appears as a shared th password that you can access. You can't even see it generally. 
Right, um, right. Yeah, like I do use LastPass. Uh, I'm familiar with it. Uh, that makes sense. I guess for me, I'm feeling like I get your feeling of wanting like to not be responsible for passwords. And then I'm also thinking like, well, isn't that kind of like convoluting the onboarding process a little bit? Um, you know, like, oh, now, so you signed up for a bot. Now you need to go get a Zapier account and a LastPass account. Yeah, like I said, man, it, it depends on the client, how tech savvy they are. It's just something that I, I feel out. And yeah. honestly, also, some of, sometimes, depending on the software you use, it also is an opportunity to make um, some affiliate revenue. It's not a huge mm -hmm. part, but it, it actually is a nice little thing that um, you kill. Oh, like, like, like affiliate revenue for LastPass? And, yeah, for, for whatever, uh, whatever you have them, have them use. Like, it doesn't hurt them. They don't care, but you get a little extra... A little extra piece. All right, a little bit of extra cheddar. A little bit of something. Right? <laughs> I mean, honestly, same thing with many chat now. Like, yeah. if you're uh, a um, what agency partner? Yeah, man. Yeah, you get twenty percent, maybe. Yeah, I do. I, I've been getting commissions now on a few of my bot projects. I mean, they always, they start at two dollars, right? Because everybody starts at ten, but some of them are going to be quite growing quick to big lists. So. So yeah, I mean that's why like I you know if I onboard them and they don't have a ManyChat account, they're gonna use my affiliate stuff for ManyChat. Oh yeah, definitely. I so like I, I view the same same way for the other stuff for me at least. Well, that's that's a good angle on there. That's interesting. That's something to consider. I mean, it's all. it's the side benefit. Like I would still do it, and I still use press stuff, but it's yeah, it's a benefit. Yeah. Well, hey man, like over time, imagine someone in the group that goes on to build you know, multi-million dollar agency and this whole time over their career, they're like just logging affiliate links with all the softwares of each client. It's actually true. Like I even like, thought about like, could I end up like templatizing the shit out of something, even selling it very, very cheaply or almost free and just having people go through an affiliate link and I would just be making revenue from, you know, however many. Well, yeah, I'd, I've been researching that a little bit. Some people are doing that. Um, are they? Yeah, it's, I've seen that out there. It's it's interesting for sure. Um, yeah, I, I don't know how I feel about it yet, and I haven't tried it. So if anybody knows somebody that's, that's doing it, uh, be be interested. Awesome. So I just want to, let's just see in the chat here. So before we move on to the next questions, because uh, can't be here all day, you know. Yeah. Um, Lucas, I just want you to um, clarify what you mean by the sales process. Explain in module four, unless you remember that process, Nick. It was, it was a little while since um, I went through the content there. Um, Lucas actually uh, replied. And oh, he, he, said it, he said it's find contact info, touch, ask for demo, do the demo follow-up. Ah. Is that the process you guys follow when you're getting new clients? Excellent. Thank you, Marcella. Does that sound familiar to you, Nick, in terms of? Yeah, I, I remember that from that. So it, it, we were talking more email sequence, right? So, or, in, right, or yeah. getting in touch with somebody like via Facebook Messenger, just saying, hey, how's it going, essentially, for the touch, yeah, demo, all that stuff. Um, do you want to answer that first, or do you want? Well, sure. I mean, look, like, like de absolutely. I mean, I guess my, what I was saying before we were able to sort this out, and Nick and I were able to jump on, um, I remember making this point earlier, is I, I like to, I, that's exactly what I do. I find the contacts, I, I, I look in groups, I look for the right types of people, you know, I'll, I'll reach out over something kind of innocuous or friendly networking, you know, then I'll, I'll kind of like show them some stuff and I'll do a, a demo and kind of follow up and just see if it was something that could be a fit for them. Um, that would be like the system around what I do and the mindset for it is just like, I'm just going to have so much fun and talk to lots of people and see if I can help them. And uh, it just makes it for me more fun in my mind. But that that that's what it is for sure, yeah. Yeah, so I, I mean, I do that too. Uh, I actually do do more of that for just like if it's a Facebook group, same type of thing, right? Like, or if I research agencies, I, a very similar approach to you, what you do. It's like, hey, let's connect about this, and then kind of take it from there. For dedicated like cold outreach, I don't do that. Um. In terms, because I know my mar I know the market, and I know the pains that they're having, and frankly, if you get a cold email outreach that's just like, "Hey, how's it going?" <laughs> there's no value there, and it's easily ignored, and it's just like, 
So I think it depends on the nature of your relationship to whoever you're reaching out to. I feel um, like that though could be applied that in a similar way. You would just kind of add market data to it and like more of a uh, compelling reason to like schedule an appointment than like a connection call. Um, yeah, hundred percent. No, no, for sure, for sure. Uh, and it, th that also, I think, speaks to like your comfort level with how you approach things. Like, I've I've tested some of that. Uh, for LinkedIn, that works better than trying to ask mm -hmm. for an initial um, call or being salesy. Your connection rate goes way down um, versus just being like, "Hey, I'm in the space. Let's connect," and then following up with some more stuff. With email, I found that that initial touch, I, I, for me, it felt disingenuous in a lot of ways to be like, hey, I love what you're doing at whatever, when I don't really know them all that well and I didn't take the time to research that person, unless I have. Mm -hmm. In which case, absolutely, I think that's the right approach and you try to add some value but also the value can be what your software and, and what your bot could do for them. Like they're in business. They, they want better out business outcomes. So at least that's how I view it. And a lot of my outreach is kind of more based on potential business outcomes along with kind of being funny and trying to add value along the way. So like we wrote a big article for Shopify plus so that that goes in the second email that I send out and it's literally like, Hey, here's the link basically. Right. So that's great. I love that. Um, I know Eric here asked clarifying about talking to fewer people. I think Jason did a good job about um, explaining that in terms of managing less people because my white label partners are the ones who manage the clients and they do their own services with them. So they're already very aware of the business and the strategy. I just talk to my partner. He's like, Hey, this is what we're doing. And then I'll create the sequence. That's the best fit for that. Um, and then we'll just try to wash, rinse, repeat in a in a streamlined and effective way. Um, so yeah, Jason, thank you for that. Cool. Um, um, right, let's see what else we got. Do, do we want to move on to like compliance with TOS or what are the other big? Yeah, I've got those questions up here. I just let me just scan here um, to make sure we don't miss someone. Is this the second part of the question? Can I just read it? Yeah, La Yvonne, LastPass is an online uh, Chrome extension you can use to save passwords and you can share passwords. Um, thanks for posting that, Jason. So one more thing in Zering, so you make them purchase a ManyChat or do you buy the ManyChat and not tell them you're using ManyChat so they don't know how e easy it is? <laughs> uh, okay, so a couple things there. I, 100% of the time, okay, not 99% of the time, the client is paying for many chat. Um, and I'm putting in my affiliate link at this point to get a piece of that. Um, there's only one client I have that where we pay it because if we, the structure deal was so long ago, we priced that in so that it's monthly. Um, so we make a little bit extra even. Um, but yeah, for me, they always pay for many chat and they'll know I'm using many chat. I don't try to hide anything. Um, they don't consider it easy. They consider it rocket science. Um, at the end of the day, building a bot is easy. Building a good bot is hard, um, or you need to really figure that out to build a good one. Um, so that's my answer there before we move on to the next one. Any thought, last thoughts there, Nick? Yeah. I, I mean, same thing. Yeah. Same. That's all I have to say. Yeah. <laughs> okay, great. Awesome. So the next, so that was kind of some client acquisition strategies, guys. So if you want to message us in the chat and let us know if some of those were helpful, I'd love to know what the big takeaway was there. Um, I think the next question here is compliance with terms of service. So does this come up for you? Like, how does, like, what is this to you, compliance? Yeah, so most often clients aren't going to know about it, but you as a bot builder definitely are responsible for understanding what you can do and can't do in terms of sending messages in, in a bot. And even when you know, Facebook doesn't always make things clear. So, <laughs> you know, how much in the gray are you willing to go for your, you and your clients? And then the other part of it, it's some, some clients will ask if they're European GDPR. That's one of the big questions that I get mm. uh, beyond just terms of service with Facebook. So that, that sort of compliance. 
Yeah, I mean, honestly, this question is interesting because it's actually really easy to follow. Um, you can go to Facebook uh, developer platform and read all the terms of service and get clear on them. Um, you know, the big one I think is the subscription messaging and the promotional messaging, right? Like that's the one everybody kind of is worried about. Like, is this against the rules? Is that against the rules? Um, and when you actually use many chat in particular broadcasts, it gives you the exact description. And so when we go there, you can see very clearly um, what is a subscription, what is a follow-up, what is promotional. And just, be, you know, the question was asked and a few people clicked. So why don't we kind of go through that? Um, Subscription is like value only. It's for free. It's something that they, we know they want. For example, um, a client that Nick and I were going over yesterday of mine is a Facebook ad strategist and um, he has a free Facebook ad training in his bot and that is a subscription sequence because there's no promotional offers. There's no like, there's nothing where he's asking for any money um, until they have engaged with the bot and received value. So, then, so also, I, yeah. I don't want to, I don't want to, so I'm gonna actually, so this is where like, I know it seems simple, but I'm going to disagree actually that that fits what subscription messaging actually is. Okay, go ahead. So for me, it's, it's much, I mean, the subscription messaging case is literally three categories, right? It's news, productivity, and uh, what the hell is the other one? Do you know it, Stephen? Um, News, productivity, personal tracker, tracker, maybe? Personal tracking. Personal tracking. Right. So from that perspective, I see what you're saying. So, I mean, I hear what you're saying. And I think that's the, that's often what most people think it is. And it's intuitive that like, okay, we didn't ask for any money. We're giving good value. It's free. Should be Should qualify under subscription, right? But if you look at... So we actually have about maybe 20 minutes, sorry, uh, left. We could maybe go a little longer than that. Um, but so, right, so back- let's just, let's just keep it going. Back to this then, okay. So for subscription messaging, right? Like it has to fit in one of those three categories. Otherwise it's technically not subscription messaging and it's in a different category. So wouldn't you say though that like what what I think is a different uh, differentiating factor is I what, what to me you're talking about is like page level subscription messaging from like the Facebook perspective, right? Yep. Um, so when like I've been sent for instance, like when I send like I had a client who sent sometimes would send broadcasts that were promotional in nature under subscription tab, right? So almost immediately Facebook seeing this page and was like, Hey, this is promotional. You know, you got to stop doing this. So I had a chat with him and uh, he stopped kind of making those types of messages. And I had kind of more rain over that. Um, when I send broadcasts about the Facebook ad training for any of these types of clients, none of those pages are, be- are getting dinged for promotional content. So I think that this is one of those areas where, Facebook is super vague. And, and I think that, you know, we're all aware of the January one thing that we, you know, they were going to implement what Nick's talking about in terms of like the page level subscription messaging that only falls into these like three or four obscure buckets that don't actually really encompass any of the bots out there or most of the bots out there. Um, even though that's like what's on the page that, that doesn't seem to me how, what's actually off, how it's actually working. Um, because I've sent hundreds of messages like this under the subscription broadcast and it's never getting kind of dinged, right? So for me, that's an allowable subscription message. Um, and it might be one of the reasons why Facebook kind of took the, took the pedal off the, the foot metal. off the pedal yeah. in terms of the mandatory page level subscription messaging. So, so I agree, right? But this is why I'm saying like, how much in the gray do you want to play for you and your client? And actually, to be honest, th- that part of it isn't necessarily gray. You're technically breaking the terms of service. I mean, you are, but you know that. I do the same for certain bots. But I've also had the experience where usually that stuff is not flagged because users are happy with it and they're not reporting your bot for it. But I have a bot that we do free, uh, free recipes every single day. People love it. Unsubscribe rate is super low. I did have somebody who wanted to work with my client report the bot. 
Facebook got back to me and about like 10 messages were exchanged and they were telling me that it didn't follow terms of service subscription messaging. And it didn't technically, I had to argue that it was actually food entertainment, which falls under a news category. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And eventually they just told me this. And it, it was various different people, right, through Facebook. So they're very strict in interpreting what they have there. So if you get caught doing it or if somebody reports it, there's a very distinct possibility that you're going to have to go through a conversation like that. That said, I think it's still in the spirit of what subscription messaging should be. It's not technically. Yeah, I mean, I think that, it, you know, I'm glad you brought that up because it's interesting to like put those things into the buckets because like the result of our interaction with Facebook is like they were saying that what we were, the other stuff we were doing was okay, right? So like that was their message to me. So so that's why for me it, it works. And I think that when it comes to like value messages, um, oftentimes you can probably force them into one of these buckets, like, you know, productivity you know, what is productivity? Like for me, learning how to be more productive as a Facebook ad strategist is, is could be productivity, um, you know, but we could kind of debate that forever. Uh, and I think that that's something that happens with Facebook because it's debated forever. <laughs> so yeah, that's, that's pretty there. much right, you know? Yeah. Uh, so but interesting. I guess, I like what would that. the takeaway from that be? Read the terms of service and... Yeah, and, and be uh, as confused as we are. <laughs> 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 yeah, totally. Uh, the bottom line, let's talk about the, you know, before we move on, because I know we're kind of running off on time. Uh, what you can't do is you can't just spam people with promotions. That we is are 100% clear you can't do. So to keep it super simple, um, uh, if you have an offer, make sure that you're offering value first and you're, you're maybe you're creating a conversation that like helps that person. And if you can fit it into those three buckets, great. But as long as you're not, you know, pinging people with offers all day without them interacting with your bot in a subscription, a subscription based spirit, um, you're generally okay for uh, how it's all, how Facebook's operating right now. Yeah. I think that's a good call. I love that you clarified what you can't do. That's, that's perfect. Cause that's definitely more clear than the rest of it. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I just try to keep it simple because do a lot of stuff. Yeah, yeah. It's exactly. It's the uh, it's the I give a shit factor. It's the like, you know, are you are you spamming people? Or are you trying to be helpful? As long as you're trying to be helpful, I think you're generally all right. Yeah, exactly. Um, so what else do we have here? Um, I think that these are pretty much what we discussed. So let's look at the next. Oh, well, you know, the next question we kind of already got into with the different types of messaging, um, subscription messaging, because all of that really ties into terms of service. Like, it's really kind of a similar question. Um, yeah, the only other types of messaging are basically, like, anything that, that's almost customer, uh, customer service related is usually just perfectly fine no matter when it happened. 24 plus, plus one. Uh, yeah, yeah. You get 24 hours plus one additional message outside of that to send absolutely anything you want uh, in terms of how salesy you can be. Wouldn't Still wouldn't recommend being over the top, ridiculous, spammy, salesy, but you can. Um, yeah, and like that's in many chat. Like, you know, I'm wearing the many chat shirt here. Um, but you can, you can go in and like you'll see the subscription promotional follow-up. And yeah, like you'll see the numbers of people. Because like when you click promotional, you're only going to see the number of people who have engaged with your bot in the, within 24 hours, right? When you click follow-up, unless you've been regularly sending messages under this category, it's usually a, a great deal more people because they don't have to have connected with your bot within that 24 hours period. Um, so I think that that's pretty clear. And also, I just wanted to throw in there that if you do want to sell, you can do a sponsored um, campaign, too. So that rule mostly applies to be able to send these messages for free. If you pay for an ad, then you could do whatever you want and, and promote anytime. Yeah, absolutely. That is a good call. Pay to play. Pay to play. 
So the fourth question here, um, I, I actually clarified this with Gustavo. So this was something that was like really got me jacked up at a conversations conference. Like I was so pumped. I remember Nick and I, you, you and I were talking about this. Um, uh, when I, th I think it was, I don't know if it was Mikel or head of business at Facebook who was there, kind of announced in a sense that that ManyChat had plans to integrate with WhatsApp and iMessage as they also are opening up their APIs for development. Um, so the fourth question is, you know, are, is there any news on that? Um, have you heard anything new? I know there was a uh, article there. Well, what's going to be? Yep. Sorry, go ahead. So last thing, I think for most people here, that might be news. Like you are right now on the forefront of conversational commerce, and it's going to be expanding to all of the major apps that people are using on their phones in a way that you might be able to create a mini chat flow that exists in, in a similar sense in WhatsApp, iMessage, and Messenger. Um, you know, I don't know, 10xing the results of these types of campaigns, right? Um, can't wait to A-B test the three platforms. I know. It's going to get really fucking interesting. Like, so what, what actually is happening, too, is Facebook announced that they're going to integrate Messenger with WhatsApp and also uh, Instagram for messages. Um, so it's going to be very interesting to see how that plays out and how many chat is going to play in with all of that. If it's all going to be one platform. I, I mean, I actually didn't read too much into the specifics yet. Have you heard about this? Uh, I think someone posted the article and I think it's like on my tab to read um, because unless it's like today, I'm sure I'll be able to figure it out when it <laughs> happens. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. So yeah, that's cool. Um, the iMessage one is going to be, yeah, because they're only a couple, a couple, I think they're beta testing for a couple big businesses, that stuff. So that'll be really cool. And then that means that probably you get out from under a lot of these Facebook terms of service stuff that were so extremely clear that we went over. Mm. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, it's great. I mean, honestly, I don't think there's really much more to that. Like Gustavo, if you're, as you're listening, it's exciting. It, it means that we're a part of something bigger than what we initially thought. And, uh, you know, full steam ahead there, gang. So um, the last question here is, Creating slash repurposing content to re-engage subscribers, especially for coaches. Hmm. Creating, so I'm not sure I get the I get the question there. So I think I think the question was maybe like, how do you create or repurpose content to engage re-engage subscribers for coaches, or for in general? Yeah, maybe. I mean, if we're just to riff on it, like, I, I would get content from the coach. It could be like a video value video they made or a blog article or maybe a course they had, a webinar maybe. And um, uh, I would basically find the key points and try to break down, like, let's say the webinar, for instance, into like five key points and try to turn that into a training or a drip um, or even like a lead magnet uh, in a more concise thought flow um yeah is that I, to riff on a little bit yeah i mean you know one person who actually just posted who's really damn good at that is mary Catherine johnson mm -hmm. um so she works a lot with coaches does webinar stuff and um very big on taking some of the coaches contents either from email and then translating it into messenger content, which actually does take quite a bit of work. I don't know how you feel about that, but have you, like, I'm sure all of us have seen the bots that just try to take these long paragraphs and insert them, and it, it's a terrible user experience. Well, we talked about this yesterday, right? Like uh, um, uh, breaking it down just into further chunks without it being kind of overwhelming. So that's kind of the talent here. You know, that like if you can get really good at and I love talking to MKJ about this stuff um, uh, as well, like she like you can get really good at getting a webinar, boiling it down to five key points, having the webinar even transcribed or let's maybe something simpler, like a five minute value video. You know, what I used to do before I had like a bot building team is I would transcribe the web, I would transcribe the value video. 
I'd break it down into like the three key points and then I would just kind of can edit it and get it, make it as concise as possible until, and then I would kind of put it in the bot and then create a conversation around the content. Um, and that to me is the real skill of all this is being able to, is to boil down content to its essence, create a conversation around it so that it's fun, giving multiple options and buttons so that people kind of can get that fun, engaging vibe and uh, also get value and a result from going through the sequence. Um, that's really the talent and it just takes time and a process around doing that. That's, that's generally my process. Um, is that kind of similar for you, Nick? Yeah, I mean, when we're talking about, so we, we talked about like templatizing things and other stuff before. So I really feel like a lot of the stuff, the top of the funnel, like getting people in and at the bottom, like a post-purchase abandoned cart, a lot of that's easier to templatize. Mm -hmm. But the stuff you're talking about is like the heart of it, like the middle of it that you need to create per person. And that's based on their content and what they have, what value they have to teach. Yeah. So yeah, I, same approach. I never transcribed the video outright, but I think that's a fucking awesome idea. Uh, and I think there are even some services that you can get really cheaply. Maricela, what's the service? Or were you, were you just using Fiverr? Speechpad. Speechpad. There you yeah. go. There you that's go. One. That's a good one. It's like, what, 10 cents a minute or something? It's real cheap, no? Yeah, they have different delivery options. So the slower you go, the cheaper it is. So it depends, you know, the turnaround time. If there's obviously no pressure, then it's it's pretty, I think it's 10 cents. I can't remember. Um, but it's it's good. Yeah, and that, that becomes either a bot flow that you can drip out. That becomes maybe the potential for a PDF as a giveaway for top of funnel. And you can take that, like if they have something valuable, you can repurpose that in so many different ways. Totally. Yeah, and that's, that's like, you know, I like how you break it down to like top of funnel, middle and end. Uh, like, like, cause that makes a lot of sense. Um, you know, like when I think about the type of bots I like to build, you know, we got lead qualifying. And sometimes we have these, excuse me, these big custom projects um, with like a teach sequence with like, or nurture ongoing. And then sometimes it's just kind of like the card abandonment stuff and like the after, you know, that, that kind of stuff at the end. Um, uh, because yeah, like some of that middle stuff is, is ends up being like those bigger projects. Um, yeah. Like I mean, some of that stuff on the ends, you can, they can be really lucrative and take a lot less time. Yeah. Just... But yeah, you're right. That's where the talent is. Like you were saying, right. That, teach the middle is a lot but also even some of them bit like micro copy that you're good at you use a lot of like emojis in the right spots um yeah yeah Images. like i just try to make it fun like i i go through it a hundred times to like get the delays right and this kind of thing and uh you know it, it it's a, I'm, that's kind of part of the fun part yeah fun yeah. so but uh that, that's that's where i get a lot of joy um, Esther's asking, what are the best bot strategies for coaches? What are their biggest pain points they can solve? I know you mentioned qualification sequence, but I'm not sure I understood it. Right. So when we're talking about lead qualifying, I was more talking in respect to like chiropractic offices and whatnot. That still can happen for coaches, of course. Um, uh, but what, what's really big for coaching is like coaches have to put out a lot of content, right? Like they are content heavy. They're always trying to like help people get results. Like building trust is a huge deal for coaches um, because think about it. It's like anybody here who's had a big jump in their life and their income and their mindsets, it's scary, right? Like there's, you're dealing with fear all the time and uh, coaches who help with this type of thing need to be able to communicate the results that their clients can get from working with them in a way that isn't freaking them out <laughs> in a way that they can build a lot of trust and have a really effective primed conversation. Um, so when I think about the biggest pain points I saw for coaches, it's, it's the classic bot Academy uh, um, system, teach, build, trust, sell. Um, I create nurture sequences for coaches that, build trust with their audience that leads them to a more primed state to buy a program. Um, you know, we follow up, we create qualification sequences for applications um, so that they can follow up for phone sales calls. Um, 
you know, those tend to be the bigger projects for me because it involves that nurture sequence, sequence, like we were talking with Nick. Um, but that that is kind of the big pain points I tend to solve, like one of the big ones. Um, Esther, does that make sense? Let us know in the chat. Does that sound uh, familiar for, with you, Nick? Have you worked with some coaches? I haven't worked with as many, but I've worked with some. Um, yeah, I, I'd say that. Uh, I would say across the board for almost any anyone or business you work with, testimonials. Oh, yeah. Especially if they have like video testimonials, real easy win for somebody because that creates trust like none other. Mm -hmm. um, I love that, this, man. Yeah. Just to that point, uh, I have in one of our sales flows for one of the coaches, I use this YouTube downloader on their, on their videos. And so when you use that, you can actually pick the size. And no matter what size you pick, it still looks really good in ManyChat. And you can put those videos right in many chat. And so in that sequence, I actually put testimonial videos for them to watch and listen to and get that energy from before they get the offer. Um, so I think that's a really good point. Yeah, I also like to use them if they don't take me up on the offer too. Uh, yeah, totally. In the follow-ups. You're like, why didn't you? I mean, you can also ask like, what well, you know, you asking questions I think is big. I think that's one thing that the, even some people do, just don't take advantage of of enough. Just fucking ask. Like <laughs> most things, like people are willing to to tell you what the issue is. Now, MK and uh, we we were talking last night actually about a very particular use case, and I'm not going to go too too far in. But if you ask too personal a question too soon, that can very much damage the or that can contribute to very quick drop off. But if you establish trust, like Stephen was talking about first, then you can start diving in deeper and being, you know, getting to the more personal issues that you might be able to to better target them later with. Totally, that's a, that's an interesting point. And what's what's great about that is that, and what's great about bots is that that's gonna that's gonna be something that becomes very clear once you get like a hundred or so people through that sequence. You'll see the drop off and the click rate for the next question. Um, so that becomes very obvious, uh, you know, that, that's a good point. Okay, so I know we're, we've done probably like almost an hour here. Is So do we want to take one last question or how are we doing, Maricela? Uh, up to you guys. I mean, we had a rough start, so that added to the time here. And I appreciate you guys hanging on and, and everybody being able to tune in. So uh, it's your call if you want to answer one more question. Um, or we yeah, can just I mean, there's, wrap it up. There's a couple here in the, in the group. Let's just uh, say that th now we're cut off. We got Dan and Jason here, and then we'll uh, we'll answer those, and then we'll cool. uh, Sounds good. From there. Cool. So uh, Dan is asking, can you explain a little bit about how Facebook ads work with Messenger bots? Can a person create a Facebook ad and send it to Messenger without first having a Messenger audience? Um, so a big resounding hell yeah. Um, that's one of the best UK use cases for Messenger. Something that we were talking about at the beginning, Dan, was lead qualification bots for ads. So I'll intentionally look for use cases where people are driving ads to a landing page that isn't converting, and I'll replace that landing page, and I'll just get the content from the landing page. I'll turn it into a chat sequence. Super straightforward. Um, you know, I recorded a video of how to set up a straight to click to Messenger ad for each client so it's just here's the code here's the video you know and then they're it's really easy for them to run ads to um to messenger to build that audience yeah and you can do it with multiple ad types to um comment to messenger right so that that one's getting to be a weird one because they, they're they're starting to control that a little more and then may or may not continue to work with ads we'll see but for now you can set up a page post. When somebody comments on it, they trigger the bot. You can advertise those posts uh, for now. So that one's also been great, especially if the page has a big audience. Uh, you can direct that toward the page because they're not all subscribed to your messenger. Probably only a tiny portion of it is. And those for one of my coaches actually have been coming in from like nine cents to 
Yeah, uh, I can't remember. Maybe it was 20, 30 cents. I can't can't recall. But very, very low subscriber cost. Um yeah, I mean, what's something interesting in auto dealers is one of my marketing partners was generating website traffic for uh, $7.50 per visitor and it's, uh, for web traffic. So that's not even like a lead, right? And so now their ads are running like $6.50 for a qualified lead that is like setting up an appointment um, through chat. So if you think about that, they were spending more money for web traffic than they are now for like qualified emails and phone numbers of people directly interested in a promotion. Um, so pretty big shift. They're, they've been pretty pumped. It's been a good partnership this last, past year. Um, yeah. Awesome. So yes, play with it. I mean, <laughs> I mean yeah, there, there, there's, and there's a good reason to actually do it. The, the Facebook, ad, the messenger ad space is less crowded or still is, I think, than most other placements. Um, so generally speaking, you'll probably be getting a uh, lower cost per, per, uh, click. Not always. Yeah. So, um, I think there's just two more here. So Dan is asking, what's the best way to create a widget in many chat for installing on a website that works as a live chat? So that's an interesting one, Dan. Um, I, I do have a strategy for that. That has been really great. Um, so what's something I'll, I'll ask a client for customer chat is I'll say, hey, what is, the, what is your ideal customer? You know, you want to learn who they really want to target and, and then make your customer chat widget reach out to those people. So it's like um, if you're a business looking for uh, just trying to target coaches, are you a coach or consultant? Question mark. And then with their then when people see that they're like oh I am chat now and then automatically it notifies somebody on the back end that someone has clicked that specific growth tool um, so that they can come in and engage with them in Messenger on the site. Um, that's something that uh, I was in a in a uh, at an event with uh, you know a great marketer Ryan Dice and that was something I took I got from from the from a little back and forth we had in the audience and it was really uh, it's been a really good move. Yeah, I like that a lot, like the specific call to action. And we actually try to do it. So for e-commerce, we generally try to do it like per category page using a different call to action. So it really speaks to like what's the issue or what's to try to remove a barrier to the sale for that page or help them do something. Um, so if we were on like a page about, I don't know, accessories for your watch, hey, can I help you find the right accessory? Right, something very specific right. like you were talking about versus, hey, can we help you with anything? Nobody's going to click on that unless they're really kind of pissed at you already. <laughs> yeah, like even on a pricing page, you know, like, hey, do you understand the pricing? Yeah, like I, I love that. That that makes a lot of sense as well. Um, did, awesome. did that answer for Dan if you're there or was that question something else? Yeah, let us know in the chat. Dan, um, Esther is asking, I think this is the last question, guys. Uh, can you talk more about outsourcing to other bot builders? Do you do that instead of hiring a team when you need help? So, I mean, that's sounding like the same thing to me. Do you, do you, do you get that one? Or, or could you clarify, Esther? I'm, I guess I'm thinking like, okay, yeah, I have a team of bot builders, but they're all individual contractors. Like, they don't know... Um, that each other exist, for example. Um, so when I have a project that I want someone to implement my strategy, um, I use Asana and I have, you know, six or seven bot builders in there and then I'll basically create a project and then just, you know, assign it to someone until someone's available. Um, and then, uh, and that's how I kind of do my outsourcing and then I can kind of project manage them in my Asana um, project management tool. Cool. I actually don't even see the question, but, but yeah, I mean, we do something very similar. We just use something uh, called ClickUp. Same thing. So personal preference. Right on, man. Yeah. So cool. I hope that answered your question, Esther. And I hope that everybody got a tremendous amount of value from our call today. It's been a lot of fun, Nick. Yeah, man. We actually, it's, it's funny. We actually don't chat this long. Usually we're both like, shit, gotta go. Gotta do yeah. something. <laughs> 
so <laughs> no, we actually had fun. time today yeah. i was like all right let's just roll with this this is perfect cool. yeah, thank you guys so much for doing this and for uh again hanging through the the setup uh conflict we had in the beginning so thanks a lot and thanks for everybody hanging on and watching thanks guys and if there's anything else follow up in um bot academy community and we'll we'll try to peek in and you know, see if we can help all yeah. right sounds thanks, good guys. thank you guys. guys all right bye